Gospel of John, chapter 4. When you look at the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ, you notice the broad spectrum of reception. And this morning, the message will be entitled, A Matter of Reception. Some people welcomed Jesus warmly and listened to what he had to say. Some worshipped him and clung to his every word and action. Many rejected him outright. On his way north to Galilee from Sychar of Samaria, and I have the map here again if you want to reference that, Jesus had been ministering in Judea. In the beginning of chapter 4, the Bible said that he needed to go to Galilee, and he must needs go through Samaria. Just as a matter of review, and, and some have not been here for the other messages, the, the, the Jews, you may or may not be aware of this, they would routinely take the circuit route through Perea and Decapolis and get up to Galilee. They hated the Samaritans. They wanted nothing to do with them. They looked at the Samaritans as half-breeds. They had mixed with Gentiles, so they were not faithful to God's law. They were not faithful to just stay with Jews. And because of that, because they didn't even worship in Jerusalem, they worshiped in their mountain um, they, they hated the Samaritans, and so they would, they would willingly inconvenience themselves, go around Samaria to get from Galilee to Judea. Jesus was in Judea. He went to Galilee. He must needs go through Samaria. Now, after having gone through the account of the woman at the well, I hope you understand by this time why he needed to go through Samaria. He had an appointment with that woman at that well. She didn't know it when she got up that morning that her eternity would be changed but it was always part of Jesus' plan. I mentioned that Jesus, in his ministry, regularly elevated the status of women. Why did he need to do that? Well, in that culture, women were not the highest members of society. Men had the positions of authority. Um, men were believed as witnesses. If there was a court case, men would be called upon to testify, not women. Jesus comes not to a man of Samaria, but to a woman. And she was not an upstanding woman. She was a woman with a past. A past that she was not proud of. A, a present that she was not proud of. Jesus confronts her and mentions that she had been with five men before the man that she was living with, and the current man was not her husband. She was not living morally upright. She was avoided by everybody. And she was ashamed of her sin, and so she avoided everybody. And as I've mentioned before, when, when we're experiencing conviction, when we realize that there is sin in our life, and before we get to a point where we repent of that, we turn away from it, we, we get that sin out of our lives and confess it, don't we often remove ourselves from contact with people that we love, people that are going to maybe cause us to reflect on the wickedness that's in our heart, cause us to reflect on that sin. We, we become distant. Many people stop coming to church because of this. And so this woman, by herself, she goes to the well. She receives what Jesus has to say after Jesus speaks to her. She very zealously, after having believed in Jesus, she goes and tells the rest of the people in Sychar. So she, they're in Sychar, uh, which is right almost in the middle of Samaria there. And she goes back and she tells these folks. Now, they knew who this woman was, but they saw a change that day. They saw a woman who was completely different. Friends, the gospel will do that to a person. The gospel will do that to you if you will let it. She goes and she testifies very openly, very, very zealously and excitedly about this man that told her everything that she had ever done. And she even confesses to the men of Sychar, is this not the Messiah? This is him. Now the Messiah, who is he associated with? Which people group? The Jews. Now the Samaritans would have known who he was, and clearly this woman did. But he was broadly looked at as the Messiah of the Jews. Now, he has saved us as well, but the Jews claimed him, and he was a Jew himself. And yet, who does he go to? He goes to this woman, this outcast in Samaria, and he witnesses to her, and he gives her grace. But then, as you go around in the, in the Gospels, the first four books of the New Testament, you see Jesus receiving a, a very different reception in different places. The three verses that we'll look at this morning... There is an interesting num amount of debate that centers around these verses. So the question is, to what exactly is the Bible referring? If you look in John chapter 4, and let me go ahead and read it so that you understand why I'm going to say what I'm about to say. Now after two days, so he was there, he remained there two days with them, preaching, and, and people were being saved. 
After two days, he departed thence and went into Galilee. So he resumes his trip north into Galilee. For Jesus himself testified that a prophet hath no honor in his own country. Then, when he was come into Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things that he did at Jerusalem, which would have been in the south. You see Jerusalem there close to the Dead Sea in Judea. But what he did in Jerusalem at the feast, for they also went unto the feast. And so there is a, an incredible amount of debate about what Jesus is referring to when it says, um, he hath no honor in his own country. Some will say that he's referring to Nazareth of Galilee. He would have grown up in, Gal- in, in Nazareth. Now, he wasn't born in Nazareth. Where was he born? Bethlehem, which is, if you look, is in Judea. So he would have been down in the southern part. He would have been born in Bethlehem. They would have been raised there in Galilee, in Nazareth. And so in Nazareth, we know that the people who had grown up with him, the people that knew him from his past, they did not honor him as the Messiah. They saw Yeshua, this boy, Jesus, that we, we say in English, they knew him. He was the carpenter's son, and they knew a little bit about his past, and they accused him of being a son of adultery uh, because his, you know, they didn't understand the virgin birth. And so they saw that the Mary was expecting before she had married Joseph, and so they, they threw all kinds of accusations. They did not receive him as the Messiah, um, immediately at least. And so they, that perhaps this could have been talking about Nazareth, but then it says in verse Uh, 45, that the Galileans received him. So Nazareth may not be what Jesus was talking about. He could have been talking about Bethlehem of Judea, where he was born. And and many in Judea caused great dishonor. And there there are some that would say that because of the dishonor he, he was receiving in Judea, that he left that dishonor and he went up. Well, that's that can't be true, because if you look back in John chapter uh, three, well, actually in John chapter 4 and verse 1, Wherefore, when the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that, he, that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, and he clarifies here, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again unto Galilee. And so there was starting to become a stir and maybe some comparison and division about you know, Jesus and John the Baptist. John had been the baptizer. That's why we call him John the Baptist. He wasn't part of a Baptist church. He was a baptizer. He, he was known as the one who baptized people. And he wasn't baptizing them into Judaism. He was baptizing them for other things, ultimately for the coming kingdom of God. But as Jesus leaves Judea, he's not leaving in this context because of rejection. He's leaving because the Pharisees are starting to really analyze his ministry. And it was not time for him to confront them, not time for him to go head to head as he would later on. Those confrontations would come, so Jesus is not leaving, and I do not believe this is talking about Judea, uh, because Jesus leaves Judea um, so that people don't draw too much attention to what he and John had done and cause problems and division there. So it's not, I don't believe, talking about Nazareth. I don't believe it's talking about Bethlehem. Um, Some believe that it could be talking about Jerusalem, which is the theological home of all Jews. Or even, some have said, it can be referred to as heaven, uh, his true home. I don't see that as a possibility. The the scripture says, uh, Jesus, uh, the the prophet receiveth no, or hath no honor in his own country. I I think that Jesus received nothing but honor in heaven. So I don't believe that heaven could be the option here. So I ruled out several things. What I ultimately believe that this is talking about, and I think if you look at the Gospel of John as a whole, this, this makes the most sense. I believe that Jesus is ultimately referring to Israel as a whole. The reason I believe that is because if you compare the reception he received at large throughout Israel, was it positive or negative? By many, it was negative. There are many people, if they even bothered listening to him, they received him as a good teacher. They received him as somebody who performed signs and could do things for them not thinking about salvation, but thinking about what they could get now, thinking about food or, or wine or whatever. So the reception that Jesus received in, in Israel, throughout Israel, by and large, was very different than the reception he received in Samaria. In Samaria, he is called the God of, or the Savior of the world. If you look at the account in, in uh, verse 42, this is not a Jew speaking this, it's a Samaritan. And said the, un, the people of Sychar said unto the woman, Now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Christ, 
the Savior of the world. A Samaritan came up with that idea, not a Jew. The overall book of John, I mentioned this in Sunday school, was written to the world, was written to people at large, Gentiles specifically, so that they could see who Jesus was. And so there are a lot of general things, there are a lot of signs, there are a lot of statements where God, Jesus is claiming to be God. And throughout this book, it is very clear that John is writing to everyone. And so it's important that people understand that Jesus isn't just a Savior of Jews, but that He is a Savior of everyone. And it is interesting that someone who is not a Jew mentions he is the savior of the world. And so I say all that to really give us some context here for what we're going to look at when the Bible says that the Galileans received him. We need to understand that there are different ways that people can be received. And first of all, we'll look at the welcoming of the savior. So if you'll look with me, John chapter 4, verse 43 through 45 again. Now after two days, he departed thence and went into Galilee. And for Jesus himself testified that a prophet hath no honor in his own country. Then, when he was come into Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things that he did at Jerusalem at the feast. For they also went unto the feast. Father, I pray that you'll give us understanding into your word this morning. I pray that as we consider these things, that we will consider how we have received Jesus. Have we received him just as a good man, a good teacher? Have we received him as somebody that we will add to our life and add to various philosophies and teachings that are combating and really contradicting one another? Or will we receive him and cling to him as our Savior, as our Lord, as our lifeline? There may be people here who are listening that have received him as a good teacher and they enjoy listening to what Jesus said, but they've really not made him personal. And Lord, I pray that today would be the day of salvation for many, the day where people would truly receive Jesus Christ, not just as a teacher or as a good person, but as Lord, as Savior, as their personal Savior. Do a great work through your word this morning. Give us wisdom, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. So as we look at welcoming the Savior here, it's important. First of all, we'll see approval in verses, and those are the wrong verses, I believe. So just disregard that. We're looking at... Uh, John chapter 4, verses 42 through 45. But there are two Greek words that we see for our one English word, receive. The first um, has to do with, and what we're looking at now is, is more of just a welcoming, more of an approval, adding something to what you already believe. Um, the other one, and we'll see this in our next point, has to do with worshiping. The word received is used 45 times. Or I'm sorry, in verse 45, it comes from a word that means to welcome. It is used several times, and in, the, in John chapter 1, we're going to see the word, in just a little bit, we'll see the word received mentioned there, and they're two different words. We get it as one word in English, and so we may not understand the difference, but they are two different words and two different receptions. As you look earlier in Jesus' public ministry, you'll see that people received him for doing different things. Again, they welcomed him, they approved him, they liked what he did. He performed wedding, a, 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 a miracle at a wedding. He gave water, um, turned water into wine so that people could have this drink. He was doing all kinds of miracles and he was doing great things for people. And so they received his teaching, they liked what he had to say. But there's going to be a drastic difference as we see the reception even of these Galileans in, in chapter 4, verse 45, then in chapter 1, and verses 11 and 12. They, they were a very diverse people, the Galileans. They were, they were more open to a variety of philosophies, a variety of teachings, a variety of perspectives. And so as Jesus comes to the Galileans, you might consider them maybe as, as similar to folks out west in our country. The, the Westerners, you know, California and others, they're, they're known to have more, maybe more of a liberal mindset, more open-minded to probably too many things. Um, unbiblical things, but they have um, you know, a, a different mindset, and so in Galilee, that was the, the case, and Jesus comes, and as a diverse people, they had been at the feast, they had gone down to Jerusalem, saw what he did at the feast, and they wanted to receive something similar to that, and so they welcomed him, they welcomed his teaching alongside other things, they just merely approved, and again, they, they added what he had to say, they weren't really, I believe, um, accepting him as their Savior. They just were receiving, again, what does it say? Having seen all the things that he did at Jerusalem at the feast, for they also went unto the feast. So that's what they were focused on. They were focused on what they could get. Today the world is full of people who are interested in what they can get from Jesus, and I'm not talking about salvation. They, they want a good feeling. They want their ticket stamped to heaven. 
they want their ticket stamp because they've come to church. And so they believe that, well, if I, if I just accept him alongside of other things in my life, but I don't remove things from my life, remove sin from my life, if I just let Jesus you know, be, be kind of out there and kind of orbit what's going on in my life, then that'll be enough and he'll be happy with me. Jesus did not come for us just to receive him with a bunch of other things. Jesus didn't come to compete with all these other voices in our heart. He came to be number one. He came to be the only voice, the only source of our truth comes from God's word and comes from Jesus Christ. He didn't come just to be added. In, in Acts, the Bible talks about Paul going to a place called Mars Hill, and it was a, a tremendously diverse place, idols all over the place, and there was an idol to, or it was an altar to the unknown God. The the people there were very superstitious, and they wanted to make sure they had all the bases covered. So they had gods for just about everything that you could imagine. But just in case they had missed one, they had this altar to an unknown god because they, they wanted all the gods out there they may not know of yet to feel worshipped. How nice. Paul sees that, and he takes that opportunity to introduce them to Jesus Christ, the one that they truly did not know, but the only one that they needed to worship. There are cultures, I think, of missionaries that I've known of that have gone to India. The Indian people, they worship hundreds and perhaps even thousands of different gods, and they have rituals and, and feasts and parades and statues galore. It's truly saddening. And so as you perhaps consider giving the gospel to somebody who's from India, they'll, they'll receive Jesus, they'll welcome him, but they'll put him alongside the other statues and figurines in their life. Because they figure, well, these gods do certain things, maybe Jesus will give me additional good luck or additional chance to get to a higher level of consciousness and eternal existence and so forth. And, and the Galileans here, again, the word for received here is not the, the personal clinging to, it's more of just welcoming and adding. So what is the difference? We're going to look next at worshiping the Savior. And for that, I'd like us to go to John chapter 1 and verses 12 and 13. John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. The word for receive in this context has to do with uh, adhering to or clinging to. Very different from just merely welcoming somebody. So let me illustrate it this way. We've had folks into our home, several of you have been to our home, and when you rang our doorbell or knocked on the door, I opened the door and I welcomed you into my home. You are probably very glad that I did not receive you the way uh, John's talking about in John chapter 1, verse 12. I did not cling on to you. I did not grab you and stick to you and just, just hold on for dear life to every one of you that came to my house. And you're probably very thankful because then you would never come back to my house again and you tell other people, Pastor's crazy. He's holding on to me. He won't let me go. But that's the idea of the two different receptions here. There's either welcoming in, and that's how I've received every guest that comes in. Now, when family come, it's a little bit different. I'll give them a hug. I don't just hug everybody that comes into my home. I'll hug my family. And when I get home, my kids are very excited to see me. And they'll come to the door, and they, will, they won't just say, Hey, Dad. Now, eventually it'll probably get to that, but right now they're still at the point where they, they love to show physical affection, right? So they'll still give me a hug, and they'll welcome me by, by coming give me a hug. You know, they'll, they'll wrap around my legs. The girls will get around my legs. Josiah will jump up into my arms. David will toddle over. Da-da, da-da, and he's just coming over to say hi. They love to welcome me, and they're doing it in a very um, intimate way. The reception here that, that John is talking about in John chapter 1 and verse 12 is not just people welcoming Jesus and adding him to a bunch of other things. This is very different. He came not to his own, for his own received him not. And that word would be talking about the, the clinging to, the adhering to for salvation. But as many as received him, clung to him, adhered, received him as their Savior. To him gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. This is true salvation. And John is clear. We, it's been months since we were in this portion. But he's very clear that our salvation, this, this belief that we have that being born again, it didn't come because we were born a Christian. You, you might have heard people say, maybe you would have said in the past, oh, well, I'm, I'm a Christian. Why are you a Christian? Well, because my parents are Christian. Christianity is not inherited. It's not passed down from generation to generation. 
I can't, just because I'm a Christian and Charity is a Christian, my kids were not born Christians. They weren't even born good. Now I love my children, but the Bible says there is none that do with good, no, not one. And eventually that fleshes itself out in human nature. Salvation does not come because of blood nor of the will of the flesh. I didn't just decide on my own, I need to become alive. I can't save myself, and that's John's point. In, in Ephesians, maybe you'll hold your place in John and go to Ephesians chapter 2. And in verse 1, we'll see this. You hath he quickened, that term means to be made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. In order for something that is dead to come to life, there has to be supernatural intervention, yes? We have all been to funerals, and I don't mean to make light of this, but we have all seen somebody's body who has passed away. That person, after the life has gone out of them, they no longer possess any will. They no longer possess any ability to do anything except lay there. They can't just decide, uh, death isn't really working out for me, I'm going to wake up. There'd be a lot of people probably having heart attacks and dying if that were to be the case. A person who is dead has no power to make themselves alive. Spiritually speaking, Paul and the Holy Spirit through Paul could not be clearer than he is here. We were dead spiritually. We didn't just decide, you know what, I'm, I'm good enough and I want to, I, I, I need to be spiritually alive and I'm going to give myself spiritual life. We can't do that. In order for a person to be made spiritually alive, there had to be a quickening work. There had to be some preparatory work of the Holy Spirit. He had to move in their heart to get them to a point where they would say yes and receive the gift of salvation. And that was how we all were. Wherein in time past, ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, that's talking about Satan, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom, talking about the children of disobedience, we also all had our conversation or the way we lived in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and we're by nature children of wrath, even as others. Before we accepted, we clung to, we adhered to Jesus Christ. This is what we were. And if you're here without a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, this is what you are right now. And it is not loving for me or for anybody else to pretend otherwise. You need the truth. You need salvation, which is only provided through Jesus Christ. And what does it say? The Bible doesn't end, and I'm so thankful this passage does not end in verse 3, because then we would be hopeless. But God gives us hope, a confident expectation. Verse 4, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Echoing what John said, it's not of the flesh. We, we can't save ourselves. We can't be good enough. God doesn't look at us did not look at us and say, you know what, you've been good enough, you've been bad up to this point, but I had a line, and you have finally crossed the good and bad line, and now you're good enough, and now I'm going to let you into heaven. I think back uh, when I was in, um, I think it was probably ninth or 10th grade, um, the war in Iraq was, was going on, and uh, our troops were converging around Baghdad, Iraq, and um, my history teacher mentioned that, um, you know, that the Iraqis basically had a line around Baghdad, and they said if the American troops and our allies, if they cross that line, then they're going to start shooting. They're going to start firing. And I had a, a, a classmate raise her hand and said, uh, is the, the line around Baghdad, is that real or is it fake like the equator? Didn't quite understand the, the whole line concept. They didn't physically paint a line. So we understand that you cross a certain point, and that's the threshold of tolerance. And, and in that case, if our troops or anybody else cross that line, then they're going to start getting fire. God doesn't have that line with us where we're, we're bad, we're bad, we're bad, and then all of a sudden we do enough good that we cross the line, and he says, all right, you're in. Salvation doesn't work that way. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. It is all just because of God's grace 
and mercy. So back in John chapter 1, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. God is the one that imparted spiritual life. We have to receive it, but God is the one that gives it. You think back to it, just so you're not flipping back and forth, think back to what we just read in Ephesians chapter 2. It is the gift of God. A gift is something that is received. It's not something that is forced upon people. When you have somebody offering you a gift, you have two choices. You can reject it. You can say, I'm not interested in this. I don't want it. I, maybe I already have one, or it's not my size, not my color, not whatever. I don't want this gift. You can say no, or you can take it and receive it. The same is with salvation. God has paid for salvation, not with your works, but with Jesus' blood. Jesus on the cross said, it is finished. Everything that had to happen for salvation to be possible was done by Jesus on the cross. That paid for the gift. God offers the gift to everyone. John 3, 16, for God so loved whom? The world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, who is whosoever? Everyone, anybody, whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. This is a gift that God is offering to everyone, and it will work for anybody who will take it and will accept it. There is acceptance, and we saw that in these verses. There is adhesion. Adhesion is when something just sticks to it, is glued to it. I saw a commercial, and I still don't believe it, and I've seen the commercial a lot. Um, it's about this. Uh, the, the creators of flex tape have come up with this super glue, and they showed them dropping one drop of course, this is all animated. They show one drop of the superglue landing on what I assumed was some industrial magnet coupling, and then they put the other one on it, and, and the claim in the commercial was that it practically cements it together or, or you know, makes it, fuses it together. And then they show a, a, a front end loader uh, with a chain hooked onto that magnetic coupling, which has the superglue dot. It's a dot. They didn't like saturate it with superglue. It was one dot lifting up three tons of cinder blocks. Now, as seen on TV, folks, if the commercial says it works, it obviously works, right? And every time we see that commercial, Charity and I will just laugh and say, there's no way. Somebody has to have tried this. And of course, in the fine print, it says, you know, do not, for demonstration purposes only, do not attempt this. Why? Because it probably doesn't work. But the idea of adhesion there is that it is inseparably glued, okay? Somebody who has truly received Christ is inseparable from Christ. Now that is very different from just simply welcoming somebody and adding them to your, your home or whatnot for a time. Those again, to refer back to my house, those of you who had come over to my house, I welcomed you, but you did not stay at my house. I love you all, but I'm glad that I can have my house to our family and not have 100 people living in my house. There just is not room. So you did not stick to us. You did not stay glued to my family. When we receive Christ, we worship our Savior. We are glued to Him. We are stuck to Him. We, are, we receive Him. We, we bring Him into our life, and we do not let go. We cannot let go. When we're saved, we'll be saved forever. And God, God brings that difference in our life. The people of Israel, some received Him truly as their Savior. Many received Him as just a good teacher, as one of the prophets. In fact, uh, we looked this morning in Matthew chapter 16. You could go ahead and maybe turn there for reference. Matthew 16. Jesus in Caesarea Philippi, an idolatrous region, asks his disciples, Whom do men say that I am? In verse 13 of Matthew chapter 16. Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And even in those days, people were divided. They had an uncertain viewpoint of Jesus Christ. They really didn't get who he was at this point. And, and I believe that it would even take some of his disciples a, a period of time before they truly, truly got it. But it seems here that Simon Peter got it. But before he got it, verse 14, some say that thou art John the Baptist, and some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, but whom say ye that I am? And it was important that his disciples knew exactly who he was. They would be the ones representing him to the world. They would be the ones preaching of him, preaching in his name. They needed to know who he was. They needed to have truly received him, and it seems Peter did. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. The term Christ there 
a Greek rendering of, of a Hebrew word also, which, uh, which is Messiah, both mean the anointed one. They were, he was anointed by God to come and to save us. The son of the living God, he said. Peter got it. He had received Jesus. It is important as we consider the world and how the world has a very different viewpoint of who Jesus is. Many will look at him as a great teacher, and I, I reference, and I don't have the quote with me, um, C.S. Lewis um, had a, a way with words. He's, read, he's written or had written many books, and maybe you've read some of his works. If not, it would be good for you to read them. They're, they're good. But he essentially said that if Jesus, Jesus is one of three things, and he used three L's. He's either a lunatic, he's crazy for believing a delusion, believing that he's God and claiming to be God. Either he's a liar saying that he's God when he's not, or he's actually God, he's Lord. He's lunatic, liar, or Lord. And he said, if he's, if he's a moral teacher, and many people will say, Jesus is a good teacher. Maybe you've heard that. Maybe you've been tempted just to believe that, to receive him as a good teacher. But then you would have to look at everything that Jesus said about himself in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In those books, Jesus repeatedly refers to himself as being God. He uses the phrase, I am, which is a reference back to the name that God gave Moses back in Exodus. God said, I am that I am. I am hath sent, tell, tell the people, I am hath sent me to you. When Jesus says, I am, he's not just using a couple words flippantly. He is saying, I am God. But people today don't believe in that. They'll believe he's a good teacher a moral teacher. But ask this, consider this, can somebody who is a regular liar and says, I am God, but isn't, is that a moral teacher? No. No, they're breaking morality. It was important for Jesus to make sure that his disciples, and for their sake, he knew their hearts, but for them to really come to the point where they answer the question, who is Jesus? Friend, I would ask you to ask yourself the same question today. Who is Jesus to you? Who does, the, who does the Bible say that Jesus is, and who is he to you? How have you received him? Again, looking at how Jesus was received. He was received as a good teacher, received as one of the prophets, received because people believed they could get something materially from him. But ultimately, by the Samaritan people and by people who truly believed in his name, he was received as the Savior of the world. So how have you received Jesus today? How have you received Jesus? Have you simply welcomed him as another teacher with another good perspective? Have you simply welcomed the information about him without actually committing to him? You might say, I believe in Jesus. I believe that you know, he is the Son of God. I believe information about him. And that's good. That's a necessary first step. We have to believe what the Bible says. But there's a difference in believing information and receiving Jesus as Savior. Hold your place if you're in John there and go to James chapter 2 and verse 19. You can believe things, you can believe certain um, facts and information about Jesus, but until you have received him as your Savior, knowing information is not going to do anything for you. Thou believest that there is one God. Thou doest well, because that's necessary. But what does James go on to say? The devils also believe and tremble. Devils, what we refer to as demons, they know who God is. They know who Jesus is. When Jesus went and, and dealt with the men that were possessed by demons or devils, they, they knew who he was. They, Jesus came, and we saw this previously. Jesus came, and they, they, um, they, they bow down to him. They worship him, not in a saving sense, but they, the demons in him caused the man to bow forward as a sign of obeisance, of, of worship, because before Jesus, those demons had to bow. They had to submit to him. He was God. He is God. They knew exactly who he was, and they called out, what, what do we have to do with you? Jesus, the Son of the Most High. What do we have to do? They, they believed that Jesus is the Son of God. But do the devils have personal faith in Christ? Will the devils ever go to heaven? They will not. So James' point is, you know things about God, you may believe information about God, but unless you have committed to Him and placed your faith in Him, received Him as your Savior, 
All of that information doesn't do you a lick of good. There are people in hell today who knew that Jesus was the Son of God but rejected him. There are people in hell today that, that believed they knew certain facts about Jesus. They might have even considered themselves theologians. They, they may have studied the Bible, but they never personally placed their faith in Jesus. And that is what makes the difference. Receiving him as Savior. So have you done that today? Have you received Jesus Christ as your Savior? Not just received him as a good teacher, not just received him as a prophet, not just received him as, as somebody who gave good things to say, but have you received him as your Savior? Until you do, you don't have a chance to see God. If you have never placed your faith completely and exclusively in Jesus Christ for salvation, you can do that today. You could do that right now. Jesus died so that you could be saved. He didn't die just so you could be informed. He didn't die just so you could be biblically literate. He died so you could have eternal life. Luke 19.10, maybe a verse that you know. If you don't know it, I would recommend you memorize it. For the Son of Man, come to seek and to save that which was lost. That's why he came. He came to seek you, because on your own, you are lost. If it were left up to you, you would be lost. You would keep wandering around, bumping into the walls in the dark. You would keep wandering around, seeking hope, seeking satisfaction, seeking meaning. Seeking a purpose. But friend, until you find your purpose in Jesus Christ, you will be empty. You will have no purpose. So, I will close with this question. What will you do with Jesus today? How will you receive him? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your son. I thank you for who he is I thank you for your word, which shows us exactly who he is. He was not just a good teacher. He was certainly not just a moral man that had a lot of good things to say. He is God. He is the Savior of the world, not just of those who are good, not just of those who love him, because on our own, none of us love him. On our own, none of us are good. Romans 5, 8. But God.